Bree, what's on your radar? Well, Robbie, you might know this about me. I'm something close to a free speech absolutist. I think that the ACLU defending the rights of white supremacists to march in Skokie was a principled stance that I respect, despite obviously being a black woman and one of the literal targets of white supremacy. I am skeptical of Twitter's authority to ban people for dead naming trans folks, even though I think it's clear that Jordan Peterson intentionally refuses to use actor Elliot Page's preferred name as a bigoted act of performative, kind of snowflakey, childish rebellion against basic civility and human decency. I am a leftist who is frustrated by the misplaced faith liberals put in tech companies and courts to protect the left's culture war victories. Twitter and Facebook aren't going to herald gender equality, and the courts have overwhelmingly favored big moneyed interests and elites over workers and marginalized groups in decision after decision. The technocrats aren't going to save us. It seems obvious to me that all we have, in fact, is each other, the people. And to that end, we have to vigorously safeguard our right to speech, our ability to communicate with each other to understand each other and to fight together for the rights we as community members believe we deserve. Because after all, it is our country. We get to decide what our communities look like, what rights should be protected, who we love, what medical decisions we undertake, how big our families should be, and how we worship, if at all. Make no mistake, these rights are under significant threat. But here's the thing, the fact that corporations like Facebook and Twitter seem eager to police the culture wars, even at the expense of First Amendment freedoms, has led some to believe that conservatives are the prime defenders of speech rights. But the reality is that corporate alignment against the people over constitutional rights is not a left or right issue, it's a top-down issue that serves to protect elite power while pitting working people against each other. Corporations don't care about pride parades or Black Lives Matter. They care about Citizens United and myriad other cases that strip substantive economic and democratic rights from the people, even as we all sit here and rage about the culture wars. Now, I have sat here with my co-hosts and agreed again and again with them that liberals were wrong to try to police misinformation with the musical loving czar or erase the Hunter Biden tapes from social media. But we don't always focus enough on the fact that right culture warriors also constitute a significant threat to fundamental rights, like speech. Last week, while I was away on vacation, a group of protesters tried to confront Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh while he was having dinner at Morton Steakhouse. They did not enter the restaurant. Kavanaugh did not see or even hear the protesters. And yet the overwhelming response from the conservative media is that these people's actions, non-violently using their First Amendment rights to articulate their political beliefs, were tantamount to a high-class lynching. Listen to reporter Peter Ducey's line of questioning to White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre last week. Is many, that it's many okay times. if protesters know that a justice is out to eat at a restaurant, well, that, pro that they can go and protest as long as they are what you consider peaceful. That's okay. Well, we have said that we want to see peaceful uh, protests. That's what we have said. We want to see the, pe the protests be peaceful, but when it comes to intimidation, that is something that we have condemned. So where's the line? If these protesters can go to a justice's house and they can go to a restaurant, where is it that you don't think it's appropriate for a group of protesters when to go? I, I just laid out, you asked me about intimidation. We condemn intimidation. We condemn any violence. And we've been very clear. That is, it is a clear, uh, it is a, a clear definition of what violence is and what intimidation is. Peaceful protest, uh, people should be allowed to be, to be able to do that. In a restaurant? If it's outside of a restaurant, if it's peaceful, for sure. Really? Peaceful protest. We're, you were, your first question so to me just, was so, intimidation. So Kareem said that, of course, people have a right to privacy, apparently not realizing the irony of the fact that the Supreme Court just held that women did not, in fact, have that right, and that that's why the protesters were outside of Morton's to begin with? Ask yourself, what should people do when they lose a fundamental right? Write strongly worded letters to the White House? If it were your Second Amendment or First Amendment rights at stake, would you feel differently about the Morton protest? 
Would a peaceful gathering outside of a steakhouse feel proportionate to you? Now, I understand, of course, that sometimes when people protest, when they're angry, there's often the simmering possibility that things could escalate. But that possibility does not excuse infringing on people's First Amendment right to congregate, to speak to each other, to rally to a cause. And I'm, I'm sorry, it just strikes me as unbelievably snowflakeish to carp and whine about a Supreme Court justice not being able to get to his dessert course at a restaurant where they're charging $19 for a hot fudge sundae. What kind of country are we when we've so tightly policed our ability to express discontent, discontent with our system? Many conservatives are frustrated that the Democrats continue to discuss the events of 1-6. Well, whatever you feel about the ideological underpinnings of that event, it feels inconsistent to simultaneously champion the uprising in Sri Lanka last week in which the president was run out of the country after thousands of citizens showed up at his residence. After 1-6, Democrats stressed the importance of a peaceful transfer of power again and again. As Americans, we fetishize the lack of revolutionary energy in this country as an American ideal. Even as we celebrate the Boston Tea Party and all of the property destruction that that entailed. Thomas Jefferson thought the Constitution should be rewritten every 19 years. But we see peaceful revolutions across the world and think, that couldn't be us, without wondering, even for a moment, whether it should be. Now, I substantively disagree with the goals of the 1-6 protesters, but it seems obvious to me that given the brokenness of our legal system, the corporate capture that has ruined our legislative system, the fact that experts have for years now warned that we do not live in a democracy, and that without, that, that without protests, nothing the people want stands a chance of actually coming to pass. Unless, of course, by some miracle, it also happens to be a desire shared by the corporate elites. That means that at this point, if a change is going to come, it's probably going to look a lot more spicy than a few signs and chants outside of a Morton's. And isn't that what we want? Change, something different. Think about it. The bipartisan response to Roe being overturned was, we absolutely must not have any property damage. You must only protest in des designated protest zones, like it's 1984. Also, vote more. They want people to do what's led us exactly to this point, and which is demonstrably ineffective. They want us to believe that voting harder will change things. Protest, sure, they say, but be polite about it. First, they took away our right to privacy. What's next? Our right to protest peacefully? The right to bear arms. Does anyone doubt that the open carry rights that the Supreme Court just upheld in the state of New York would suddenly come with myriad caveats if the location of those arms were outside of Kavanaugh's residence? Are we happy with a contingent constitutional system? where the consistent contingency seems to be protection for those with money and power. Meanwhile, instead of talking about what it means for your First and Second Amendment rights to be slashed if you're exercising them in defense of working class freedoms, the political right is obsessed with culture war nonsense. Take a listen. Still inspires everybody today, all men are created equal and all this kind of stuff. A great architect, scholar, you know, Thomas Jefferson. And instead, I got you know exactly the opposite. It just uh, yeah, debunking his his history, his reputation, uh, putting him down, uh, demoralizing everybody on my tour. It was it was just sad, sadly predictable too these days. I just thought that maybe Monticello would be protected from this uh, disease of wokeism. Oh, are his fifis hurt? My goodness gracious, that's a Fox News host, uh, a Fox News conservative rather, who was mad at Thomas Jefferson's house, a, a, a literal slave plantation. The fact that tour guides discuss it as such, a slave plantation. The purpose of said house, the financial mechanism by which Thomas Jefferson supported himself was slave-based agriculture. But this guy is mad that he went on a tour of Monticello and that was even mentioned? It demoralized him? Was this news to him? 
Look, this is what liberals are talking about when they say the right is hypocritical about free speech. When they say the right is not upset about CRT per se, but the teaching of basic historical facts like this, I don't know what kind of bizarro historical erasure you'd have to engage in to pretend that America's most famous slave owner's house, a place, I'm sorry, I didn't make this up, where he kept humans as chattel, raped a 16-year-old slave repeatedly, his wife's enslaved half-black sister, by the way, history's amazing, is anything other than what I've just described. It's just completely compatible to understand Jefferson as a scholar, as a brilliant visionary, if you want, at the same time that you acknowledge his flaws. But the anti-speech zealots on the right want to constrain our understanding of history to weed out the inconvenient facts. Again, it's like something out of Orwell. I gotta say, a week after coming back, from vacation. Coming to these media spaces sometimes makes me feel like I'm losing my mind a little. It feels like no one's really in the right. And it's exhausting detailing all the reasons why no single party and very few media spaces truly seem to operate with the requisite amount of nuance and honesty and willingness to admit they're wrong. It's incredibly isolating. And it feels sometimes like it's by design. 1970s poet and musical phenom Gil Scott Heron famously said the revolution will not be televised. And he was right, if only because any truly revolutionary content on here will be censored, banned, canceled, all while we debate, for some reason, Jordan Peterson's substantive merit, while we're being told to define our politics on the basis of what we think about transition surgery, or if academic terminology like chest feeding that even most trans folks don't use uh, are a problem. You know, other countries, while we're doing all that, are in the streets, demanding more of their leadership, or frankly, chasing them out of the country if they aren't up to the challenge. Now, this is not a call for an insurrection, but it is a call for us to interrogate our political priorities and to question why the parties seem to be aligned on passing bills to fund security for elite justices, to fund wars, to push austerity politics that raise unemployment and ship jobs overseas, to defund social security and the like, all while they insist that we have to stay docile. So docile, in fact, that we can't even avail ourselves of our First Amendment privilege to ruin Brett Kavanaugh's dessert course. So. Robbie, I, I just couldn't help mm. but notice this overwhelming thrust from both sides of the aisle. Don't do anything. Don't raise your voice. Don't protest in even the mildest manner possible. At the same time, I see Tucker Carlson kind of saying, hey, look, these people in Sri Lanka doing their thing, getting people out, rabble rousing, advocating for their interests. And the fact that we seem to be able to look abroad and say, oh, it's a good thing when people stand up for themselves. But here in the United States of America, think it's a bridge too far for Justice Kavanaugh to be protested legally and peacefully, even though he did not even see or come in contact with or even hear the protesters. To me, there's a relationship between that attitude we have in the United States and the fact that we don't have anything here for the people. Okay, so I, I think we don't have any disagreement on what the legal status should be. Yeah, it's absolutely should be protected to protest people, even in very close proximity to their homes, et cetera. Um, I guess I would say, do you think it is effective? Mm. And do you think it does good for the cause to, I don't know, call in a bunch of fake reservations to Morton's or like that sort of thing? Is that, is that making the cause for which people are protesting Kavanaugh seem more sympathetic? I don't know. But I do know that it's not effective to tell people to have White House reporters and conservative commentators and elected officials on the right telling people that they have somehow done something wrong, opining on their substantive, the, 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 the way they've chosen to protest when there's already such an assault on free speech first and foremost. It's not my job, your job, or certainly Peter Ducey's job to do comms for abortion activists, to, to do comms work for them. That's not their job. So why are they weighing in? They're not weighing in because they have a, a, you know, a substantive concern. Oh, I really hope you get your message on abortion rights across. If you just did it a little bit differently, I'm, I'm sure you'd be more successful. Now, Peter Ducey doesn't care about that. 
what he what they're doing is constraining what they feel like people have uh, what opportunities people have to avail themselves of to make themselves heard. And I'm sorry, substantively you can disagree about the underlying cause of Black Lives Matter as well, but that's what that project was about. Both parties were united in saying, don't rabble rouse, don't, don't disrupt capital, don't cause any inconvenience in the street, don't block traffic, don't make it difficult for us to continue to make money. That is, the, the, that is the bipartisan consensus around all of these, whether or not you're protesting, it's a trucker's boycott. Remember how they, they acted like blowing, blowing your horn in the street and obstructing traffic was full-blown fascism? Now, again, I disagree with the underlying mm -hmm. objectives of that boycott, mo most of them. But the reality is that there is a, a really dangerous creep that I'm seeing where things that are the most innocuous forms I, of I will, so I will agree. are being vilified. Morton Steakhouse, are you kidding me? I will agree that there is a tension sometimes among some commentators on the right between the, yes, we're the free speech tribe now, and the condemning of wokeness when it goes into the, and I think it should like essentially be criminalized or something. It's fine to just criticize wokeness, just like it's fine to just criticize protesters or their tactics. I do it all the time, but the answer to it is not to broadly criminalize it. And if you are someone on the right who thinks that is the answer, you should consider how that will be immediately used against your own side in the same, and, and, some, and people on the left know that on the hard left many mm -hmm. of them do know that i think some in maybe the squishier liberal camps don't quite understand right. how and I power can be exercised too. against like, them i this is why i fall out of step with many members of the broad <laughs> left of many liberals when it comes to things like this twitter stuff i can substantively say i strongly disagree with jordan peterson and i strongly disagree mm -hmm. with people who made uh you know elliot page's dead name trend on Twitter at the same time that I have concerns about relying institutionally on Twitter or Facebook or even the Supreme Court to be policing the substantive values that I think as a community we should share. And so often I think that when we pivot to, well, Twitter's going to take care of it, the Supreme Court's going to take care of it, even the legislature is going to take care of it. What we fail to do is engage in the conversations with each other and have the substantive conversation about, well, what kind of people do we want to be? Let's not talk about the Twitter ban. Do we want to be people who have basic respect for mm -hmm. people's preferences and name preferences and decency or not? And when the conversation is at that level, if people want to expose themselves, as I think Jordan Peterson has done, and say, I don't care, I don't respect this actor, I don't, I don't want to use their preferred pronouns, well, then we can all judge that for what it is and move on with our lives. But when it gets caught up in these kind of structural battles about, well, but is Twitter good? Oh, but is the government good? But we all end up passing, talking past each other. We don't Mostly have a good no sense and of, definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> good of, of what the community wants. We talk yeah. about our country like we don't have a choice. We talk about our government like it wasn't designed by us for us. I mean, it wasn't actually, but we were supposed to at least have the right to make it work for us now. And now we live in a world where there have been these in incredible overreaches in terms of our ability to actually use the levers of democracy as they were designed to work for the people. Enormous amount of corporate and political capture. And at the same time, they want to take away those rights which were enshrined that were supposed to be able to give us a voice despite those kinds of overreaches. And when we get to the place where we're saying you can't even say Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, on a tour of his slave plantation, and when you can't say that, hey, you took away my privacy right and I'm upset about it to a Supreme Court justice because that infringes on his privacy right, and you have people unironically saying, doesn't Justice Kavanaugh deserve I, a right I, to I privacy? I agree that that was a little snowflakey, the Jefferson thing, so. But not the Kavanaugh thing. You think he should have been able to have his son? I don't think it makes any difference to the cause if we harass people inside dollars. But that's not the I question, don't. Robbie. The question I, and is I say you can right to do it. Well, I no, that's not a question because they do have the right to do that. Well, Peter do see not, things otherwise. And a lot of well, conservatives in the wake of He's not of sitting this, in the chair. In the wake, in the wake. And, and, I know, and frankly, we all look the same to you. <laughs> just, <laughs> just kidding. But like, honestly, like even, even Joe Biden, uh, there is my, my concern and, and start paying attention to this. Look at who is making, saying those kinds of statements. Joe Biden says the same exact thing that Peter Ducey is saying every single time one of these events pops off. Joe Biden sat there and said to the Black Lives sure, Matter protesters, right, yeah. the same thing the conservatives saying to the Black Lives Matter protesters. Because yeah. at the end of the day, there's a long history of civil dis disobedience in this country and around the world and what it can achieve. And that's what they're really afraid of. Well, thank you for that, Brianna. We'll have to leave it there and we'll have more rising right after this.